And again, um, welcome. <laughs> Welcome everyone, and very excited to have Mr. Simons here with us. I'm going to introduce our speaker and then turn it over to him. Um, but I know the last time that we had our in-person program, it was super um, crowded. It was It's always a popular program here at the Refuge, but also um, virtually tonight. Jerry Simons is PAC, graduated from SUNY Stony Brook's Health Science Center with a degree in cardiorespiratory sciences and went on to graduate from Cornell University's Medical College's Physician Assistant Program. He's national, nationally certified as a physician's assistant with commendation in both primary care and surgery. Jerry is a clinical assistant professor and on the faculty of Stony Brook University Physician Assistant Program as it, and is an instructor at several major universities. He's award-winning international medical education lecturer, has developed educational programs used by physicians and health providers, and is a published author on Lyme and tick-borne diseases. In 2010, he won the National Award from the Tick-Borne Disease Alliance. In addition to teaching at Stony Brook University, he also also practices at the Morrison Center in Watermill. So thank you so much for being here, Jerry, and I will we'll turn it over to you. Great, Kara, thanks for that uh, great introduction. Um, I've spent a lot of time with my kids uh, running through trails uh, in a safe way and visiting the animals and going to some of the places. So, you know, those of you that aren't in town, at least check out the website. Um, it's definitely um, a pretty cool place. Uh, we also have Karen Wolfrat here, who's our Tick Center Administrator. And probably all of you know uh, Rebecca, the voice of our Tick Hotline, which uh, I'll give us a wave, Rebecca, which we'll uh, get into um, in a minute or two. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to keep an eye on the chat if you have questions, but I certainly can hang around at the end to answer all the questions um, questions that you need. So great. So uh, very exciting. Um, a big project that we worked on, basically Karen worked on all last year through COVID was developing our reference handbook, which is the leading authority in the area on prevention and types of ticks and diseases. And guess what? They're free. You don't have to buy it. You can call our hotline or email, and we can figure out a great way to get it to you. We'll mail it to you, pick it up, something like that. So I know it's after five o'clock, but we're all going to start with a pop quiz. Dun, dun, dun. You could jot your answers down, and we'll go over the answers at the end. So everybody, think about this. Number one, ticks only make you sick if they're attached for more than 24 hours true or false. Number two, Lyme is the only serious tick illness, true or false. Number three, the alpha-gal meat allergy, come on, we all know someone with alpha-gal, right? The alpha-gal meat allergy can be deadly, true or false. Everyone with Lyme remembers being bitten by a tick, true or false. One of my favorites, the CDC says a positive Lyme test is required to diagnose Lyme, true or false. Look at this one. A tick can give you more than one illness, true or false. A summer flu could be a tick illness, true or false. We will provide you with one of these amazing free tick kits. Free, true or false. We'll find out at the end. You can only get a tick bite in warm weather, true or false, and 90% or more of people get over Lyme uh, easily, true or false. So some key points is, you know, please remember everybody that these are all true, by the way. Uh, tick diseases are definitely preventable, which is why I'm a major fan of the four poster system as a prevention um, of blocking ticks from uh, being moved around on deer. Common sense things like avoiding brush and woods and trails, eliminating mice and bird havens, like getting rid of wood piles is a must. Destroying your bird feeder and bird bath is a must. Those birds bring in a lot of ticks to your yard. 
always use two layers of protection, put something on your skin and something on your clothing. I'm a big fan of duct tape, wrapping it around my sock and pants leg and capturing any ticks that might be calling up my leg. If you find a tick, uh, remove it as soon as you find it, label it and save it. We'll talk about whether you should test the tick later on. And a summer flu, uh, Rebecca was just on uh, CBS uh, News talking about this. You could Google that show. Um, could be influenza, could be COVID, or a summer flu in the Hamptons area could be a tick disease. So what I wanna talk about in the next hour are Lyme and some of the Lyme infections in the news, some of the other infections, the types of ticks that you might be already finding on yourself, how to diagnose and treat it, prevention. And on one of our favorite websites, tickencounter.org, they talk about, are we in a ticknado? Not a tornado, but a ticknado. Now, just a disclaimer, you know, everything we're talking about is kind of my own hot-headed opinion, but pretty much every slide has a scientific or CDC reference, right? You talk to 10 people about ticks, you might get 20 different answers, right? So uh, here's a picture of our tick kit, which has the really fine pointed tweezers on it, which is critical to getting the tick off, band-aids and bacitracin and everything you need. And it's got a clip, you clip it right on your hiking pack. So the number of vector-borne diseases, mosquito, tick, fleas, is just skyrocketing and continues to climb. Uh, recently, there's been 300,000 cases of Lyme reported. And remember, people, not all cases are reported. So there's a lot of Lyme and a lot of infection from vectors, mosquitoes, tick fleas that are out there. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Naturally, the warmer weather is the most common time when we see ticks. There's a lot of baby ticks out right now. Look at June and July. People, we're in peak, peak battle season right now. We've got permethrin and DEET and eucalyptus and everything like that, right? Um, so this is where we're really seeing people coming into our office with uh, tick bites and our telephone is just lighting up with all kinds of calls. So look at this. This is all the places in 2001 where Lyme was reported, right? A little in the West Coast, um, a little bit from Chicago all the way north uh, through Michigan, a little bit in Texas. And now in 2011 and then even 2021, it continues to spread, right? So we're seeing a greater geographic distribution of particularly related to um, Lyme disease. People, part of that reason actually is climate change. The warmer climate means nymphal ticks, the teenagers and larva show up faster and earlier and there are more of them. October has generally been a warmer month over the um, last decade and they predict that it's only going to increase through the 2050s. Another interesting thing, people, I thought this was fascinating. The Canadians were able to document that because of climate change and migration of deer and animals, that Lyme disease moves northerly into Canada, about four kilometers north into Canada every year. There are doctors and PAs, physician assistants, seeing Lyme disease in Canada where it didn't exist a decade ago. So not only is it, you know, the, our population expansion, but there's also climate change and warming that is definitely affecting uh, the spread of these diseases. Number two, even though we're in peak battle season, if you're writing notes, write that down. We're in peak battle season against the ticks right now, right? We do see tick bites all year round. Um, in fact, here's a famous picture from one of our favorite websites. 
this is what Karen and I do at our homes on a Friday night. We just explore the Tick Encounter website, right? It's got lots of great info. Um, here's an actual picture of a tick coming through the ice, probably to come after you, right? So ticks are a year round phenomena. I see plenty of people around Thanksgiving when they're raking their lawn and picking up leaves because there are ticks hidden under there and they just aren't using protection like they use in, Ju like they use in June, July, and August. Look at this amazing story. There are so many ticks that in Maine, the moose are literally covered with ticks, right? And in 2017, they documented that ticks were killing about 70% of moose calves from Maine and New Hampshire. Now, people, when I was in college, we all wore t-shirts and made signs saying, save the whales, save the whales. But in 2021, I'm telling college kids to make signs and wear t-shirts that say, save the moose, save the moose, right? Um, Look at this. In the winter, ticks by the tens of thousands can live on a moose. You could find a moose with 20, 30, even 40,000 ticks on it. And it literally can just drain them of all of their blood. So climate change is one of the biggest things in the news. Any of you following pop culture, you might remember the story about Justin Bieber. Oh, he looks like a wreck, he's covered with bruises, he doesn't shave, he's not dressed, he's not making concerts. Um, you know, they thought that he was becoming a drug addict again. But when you read the story about Justin Bieber, he was suffering from Lyme disease. And after he got treated for Lyme, he started looking normally again, normal again. Many of you remember the singer Chris Christopherson who uh, was diagnosed as Alzheimer's, couldn't tie a shoe, couldn't remember his wife's name, forgot how to operate a pen, go to the bathroom. And looking at his history, the wife said, would someone please give Chris Christopherson a month of doxycycline? And wow, he started to regain a lot of his memory. So, you know, all of us, right, on Long Island, we're talking about Lyme disease and ticks and meat allergies in one way or another. Ali Hilfinger and Yolanda Hadid both wrote books about, you know, their story and plight with Lyme disease. So if there's anybody on tonight that, you know, thinks they're dealing with Lyme disease, these are some famous stories that show that you're not totally out there. This was really interesting um, from Stanford University, where they actually did, they were given a grant from the Global Lyme Foundation to study the idea about Lyme disease and how easy it is to get rid of and if it lingers. Now, they actually found and published that for 10 to 20% of people, the disease persists, causing joint pain, neurologic difficulties, and fatigue. So, you know, the debate is, is there infection left? Or is this an immune problem, old inflammation and autoimmunity and things like that? So that's kind of the classic story that we, um, that we look at. So even Stanford says that, you know, Lyme disease is something and those symptoms can persist for a long time. For those of you that took quiz, one of my questions at the bottom was 90% of people or more who get Lyme disease get over it. And guess what? My answer tonight is that's absolutely true. If I see, you know, 10 people with a red ringed rash or a weak face or swollen joints, and we get them on medicine pretty quickly, they're going to get over it, right? Now, there, like Stanford says, there might be that 10% of people where it lingers for a long time. So on a July 4th weekend, if a um, hundred people in the Hamptons get Lyme disease, right? 10 of them may be left with long standing symptoms. So there's this debate that you might never get over Lyme disease. That's false. If you're treated early, you're gonna get over it. 
10% of people may have these lingering symptoms. And that's a whole nother talk about Lyme disease and persisting. So what does Quag Wildlife and the Southampton Tick Center want you to know? What do we need you to learn in the next hour? Number one, right? Prevention, right? If you don't get a tick on you, you're not gonna get sick. The other important thing is the most common age group for Lyme are young boys, like age five to 10. They're the ones out there in the woods, not using you know, tick repellent and things like that. A summer flu in an endemic area, think Lyme disease. We're also checking for COVID, but definitely think Lyme. Look at this, blood tests are not accurate early on. If you've been sick for 10 days, you're not going to be able to catch that in the blood. Also very important, ticks carry more than just Lyme disease. There are other germs in the tick that we're gonna talk about. When you're out walking around, please make sure you do regular tick checks. If you're working in your yard or hiking, make sure you do regular tick checks. One of my favorite things is I purchase a lint roller and I roll this up and down over my shoes and on my legs. And if there are any little ticks crawling on there that I can't see, this lint roller is going to be able to catch them. So again, it's kind of funny, you know, you see these big Hulk Hogan construction workers walking out of the store with like all these lint rollers, like good for you, you're preventing Lyme disease. Now, sometimes kids with Lyme may not have the flu or joint pain. They may have a strange change in behavior or a sudden drop in their grades. And in my opinion, it's always better to treat early. Hey, if it's July 4th weekend and somebody comes in with a flu and their COVID swab is negative, I'd much rather give them medicine early while we're trying to figure out what's going on with them, right? Because again, 90% of people treated early are gonna get over it and not gonna have a problem. So again, what is Lyme disease, right? Uh, what exactly is Lyme disease? There's 80 of us in the room here tonight. And just in case you don't know, Lyme disease is an infection caused by a bacteria, right? It's a germ and it makes us sick. And it kind of looks like this little classic corkscrew shape. And that corkscrew can act like a drill and get through cells and into tissue and things like that. There are lots of variations of the germ. So there are many different presentations. You know, I remember my cousin had Lyme disease and her knees swelled up like cantaloupes. But my neighbor had Lyme disease and he got a facial weakness called Bell's palsy. Both Lyme disease, but different presentations. So one of the things scientifically that we're arguing about is how do you define Lyme disease? The CDC says Lyme disease is defined as an infection by Borrelia burgdorferi. But if you listen to what I just said, there are many kinds of Lyme. We know that there are different types of bacteria. Borrelia mayoni, Avzeli, Borrelia garnini. And the Mayo Clinic specifically says Lyme disease is caused by one of these four organisms, okay? So we generally go with the Mayo Clinic definition. And guess what? You could have a tick that has Borrelia burgdorferi and Borrelia mayoni, and you're actually gonna get two types of Borrelia with one tick bite. Dun, 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 think about that. So here's my favorite definition of Lyme disease, right? Lyme disease is a multi-systemic tick-borne infection. So if somebody comes to me and they're like, Jerry, my head is killing me. It must be Lyme disease. I'm like, hmm, probably not. Or somebody comes to me like, oh, I'm so tired. It must be Lyme disease. I'm like, hmm, probably not. Or something along those lines. But if people have two systems involved, like facial weakness and joint pain or joint pain and the flu, multiple parts of the body, that's more consistent with Lyme disease. The exception of, is that red ringed rash called erythema migrans. So if you have a red ringed rash, that's Lyme without any other symptoms. 
Look at this. The organism is able to evade host immunity, which means when we do a blood test checking your immune response, that blood test may not always work. And there's always somebody on Facebook saying, I have Lyme disease, but my test was negative. I'm like, okay, I can understand that. That's been published. And it can persist as a latent infection. Well, that's interesting. That's what Stanford University also published the same thing, right? So uh, this is uh, Ben Loft from Stony Brook. So you've got East Coast and West Coast publishing on a lot of the same stuff. So, you know, when someone says they got a tick bite, I kind of associate that with like stepping on a dirty needle. Ouch, right? Ticks nature's dirty needle. Ticks live for two years in the dirt. They feed on the blood from all kinds of different animals like mice and deer and foxes and birds and even you, right? These are dirty little creatures. So what do ticks look like? There are many different kinds of ticks, even here from Manorville out to Montauk, there's different kinds of ticks that we're going to see, right? And they can be found at different stages of growth, right? The baby ticks are typically called the larva. People, if you're taking notes, write this down. The larva typically has three legs on each side, a total of six. And the larva typically don't have infection. The nymph is the hungry teenager. People are getting nymphal tick bites like crazy right now. And then they grow to either an adult male or an adult female. So when someone comes in, I try to train all of my patients to bring the tick in so I could see it. If the tick has six legs, I'm like, mm, I really don't think you have anything to worry about. Um, this is a larval tick, they don't have infection. But if it's a nymphal or adult, especially a deer tick, that's where we might think about giving some medicine as a preventative if it's a risky tick bite, okay? And tickencounter.org actually has a great tick identifier. So you can even like a picture and figure out what tick um, you had. And in our amazing um, tick kit here, uh, Karen has put in these great little guides. And that's a great way to figure out um, what kind of tick is on you. By the way, spoiler, these tick kits with the forceps and the Band-Aid and the bacitracin and the tick card, they're free along with this amazing guidebook that we've written about. More info on how to get your tick kit at the end. Nymph and adults, again, have eight legs. So please, if you get bitten by a tick, don't burn it or flush it. Try to save it so you can have a professional look at it. Now, right now, we're in deer tick season, although I've had some people with dog ticks and lone star ticks, right? On the upper left here, we have the famous female deer tick. That's the Lyme tick. In the middle here, we have that lone star tick with that famous white dot. That's the one that gives you the alpha-gal meat allergy, right? Uh, we have the wood tick. We have the dog tick and the new visitor in town, um, like that crazy cousin that always invites themselves for a weekend, even though you never really invited them and they show up on your doorstep with their luggage, but that's a different Zoom altogether. Um, the Asian longhorn tick, which originally was found in New Jersey a few years ago, and it's now in Connecticut. And I believe that they've found it in um, Suffolk as well. So the Asian longhorn tick, right? Um, again, about 12 years ago, uh, it first started to be noticed in um, North America. And they've been able to test this. And the Entomological Society um, of America found that about one in every 250 of these longhorn ticks actually have Lyme disease. So that's a new and developing story. So definitely Asian longhorn ticks, we're saving those because uh, the Suffolk County Department of Health wants to study these things. So keep an eye out for the Asian longhorn tick. 
it mainly goes after sheep, cows, cattle, things like that, where um, it, you know, then transmits its infection. Right now, as I said, it's deer tick season, right? Uh, the deer tick larvae uh, typically come out end of summer. The deer tick nymph, those are the teenagers, right? Are the ones that are most active now. The deer tick is the one that carries the infection. Lyme, Babesia, a germ called anaplasma, and Powassan virus, the deer tick virus, is also carried by um, deer tick. It is interesting that the Powassan virus has a very short transmission time, about 15 to 20 minutes. So if you see a tick on you, you have to remove it right away. Don't leave a tick on until you get home. Very important. That was one of our quiz questions. The deer tick female, right? I mean, when we see the deer tick female, look, even in the winter, right? January in the fall, right? We're seeing activity now. This is the adult um, we're talking about. Powassan virus, anaplasma, babesia. Look at this amazing study from 2019. Only a minority of children with Lyme recall having a tick on them. If you have a tick in the back of your hair, behind your knee, between your butt cheeks, you might never find it, right? It falls off and you never even know it was there. So that's why when we ask people if we're worried about Lyme disease, have you been in a place where ticks are? Not do you remember having a tick on you? Again, save the tick, save the tick, save the tick, right? Dog tick, right? We know dog ticks don't transmit Lyme disease. So we don't really give prophylactic medicine for these dog ticks. But they can give you Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, which is the headache and the rash on uh, the palms. They can sometimes give you um, tularemia as well. So when a patient calls my office and they say, I have a tick bite, I always say, can you bring the tick in? I want to know the type of tick. Is it a larval, nymph, adult, things like that. So most dog ticks, we're watching them. We're not necessarily giving them prophylaxis. Lone star tick, right? The females have that famous dot on it. The men kind of have a clear ring around the edge, right? Now, Lone Star is what gives you alpha-gal, and alpha-gal also has a very short transmission time, you know, less than um, a half an hour. Now, alpha-gal makes you allergic to certain kinds of meat proteins. So I haven't officially published it. This is just Jerry's own hot-headed idea, but I've told people after you get a Lone Star tick bite, don't eat meat for a month, because if you don't introduce that allergen, you might not trigger that reaction. And so far, I've had pretty good luck with that. I should probably do that as a more formal research project. So the Lone Star Nymph, right? Remember I told you before, the Lone Star Nymphs are just coming out. So we have been seeing deer ticks and Lone Star Nymphs right now. Ehrlichia and sometimes tularemia in the Lone Star, right? So Lone Star Tick can give you a bacteria called Ehrlichia and also tularemia, which is related to cat scratch fever. Now, in another famous controversy, people talk about Long Island chiggers, right? Well, we really do not have chiggers on Long Island, right? But these are actually baby Lone Stars. In fact, this is a picture a patient sent me each one of these is a little baby tick, right? This is where you want to try to grab that lint roller and pick up as many of them as you can. And this lady, I definitely said, don't eat meat for a month. So there are no chiggers on Long Island. They're baby Lone Star ticks. So again, remember that the tick lives for two years, right? Um, of course, the mom has the baby eggs. One tick could have like a thousand eggs. It's crazy, right? It grows into the larva. That larva needs to eat. 
it eats on a mouse, a bird, a chipmunk, right? So if, like I told you in the beginning, get rid of your wood piles, get rid of your debris, get rid of your leaf piles, anywhere that a mice is, or chipmunks will live. Use those little um, tick tubes filled with permethrin and cotton balls. Also, yes, people, we didn't say this was all gonna be good news. The bad news, as I said in the beginning, tonight, not tomorrow, not next week, tonight. Get rid of your bird bath, get rid of your bird feeder. Those attract birds, which drop ticks, and mice and squirrels and chipmunks feed on any of the food that's dropped off. So gotta do it, people. If you wanna avoid ticks, get rid of bird baths, bird feeders. Remember, do it tonight, not tomorrow. After that meal, the larvae grow into the nymph, which you remember is that hungry, hungry um, teenager, and they're always looking to eat, right? Fall into winter, the nymphs are more uh, dormant, right? And then spring to summer, the nymphs come alive, they wake up, and they want their second meal, which is usually going to be us, right? The nymphs also molt into adults. So when someone says they get a tick bite in December, I'm thinking as an adult tick. If someone gets a tick bite in the spring, I'm thinking it's a nymphal or a larval tick, right? And then they might have um, a third meal if they didn't have that second meal already. And then they lay their eggs and it starts all over the place. So having an idea of the life cycle of a tick is gonna tell us how to defeat them and get them out of their yard. So we talked about the different kinds of ticks. We talked about uh, the diseases they carry and how there are different strains of Lyme disease. So how do we diagnose Lyme disease? Well, if you go to the CDC website, they say that you have signs and symptoms of Lyme, which you're going to look at. Number two, the likelihood of being exposed to black-legged ticks, the deer tick. Possibility that other illnesses may be causing symptoms. Is it actually COVID or the flu or rheumatoid? And results of lab testing when indicated. So very important, this was on your quiz. Nowhere in the CDC protocol does it say you must have a positive test to diagnose Lyme disease. So many patients get caught up on, oh, but my test is negative. I'm like, yes, but you have every single symptom on the CDC checklist and you're a Manorville or Montauk landscaper. Dun, 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 right? Of course, just having the rash uh, is diagnostic of Lyme. And most of the time they have that classic bullseye central clearing, but not always, right? That's that early stage. Look at stage two, which is the neurologic. Headache, for example, numbness, tingling, especially at night, that can go on for months, right? So again, you know, Lyme disease symptoms definitely can linger. Here's the CDC Lyme disease symptom checklist, right? Fever and flu-like can occur without a rash, right? People have Lyme without a rash, right? Um, there might be a little tick bite reaction that will go away in a day or two. There's another disease called Starry, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, which is not an infection, but most of the time the rashes look the same so whether it's starry or Lyme, we're still treating them. And ticks can make you sick from other things also. We're gonna look at that in a minute. Now, later symptoms, right? Later symptoms can be headache and neck stiffness. When a patient like, comes to me and they haven't been in a car accident and they have, they have whiplash and they're moving their head like this, like they don't wanna bend their shoulders, I'm thinking that that's like Lyme related right? Arthritis with joint pain and swelling, intermittent pain in the tendons, muscles, and bones. So people, when someone comes to me and they're like, oh, my knees hurt all the time, it must be Lyme. I'm like, hmm, probably not. 
everybody listening out there. But if they're like, oh, my shoulder hurts and then my neck hurts and then my hip hurts and then my knee hurts. Now that sounds more like Lyme, these migrating kind of symptoms. Shooting pain and numbness and problems with short-term memory. Where did I put my keys? Why did I leave my house with only one shoe on, right? Now, not to get all sciency on you, but this is just fascinating. This is like what keeps me up at night. PAs and nurse practitioners and med students almost all read this famous textbook called Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine, right? And one of the first things they describe about Lyme disease is Lyme lives in a microaerophilic bacterium. It hides deep in the body, like in the cartilage where there's not a lot of oxygen. And the genome, you know, is very small. And it has a highly unusual linear chromosome. So this is a very unique, interesting germ. Look at this, a quote from Harrison's. The most remarkable aspect of Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the Lyme germ, is that there are sequences for more than 100 known or predicted proteins. So that means there are multiple strains of Lyme, and Lyme is probably the most complicated bacteria known to science. Here's a great story. Everybody out there ready for a story? If you're not, I'm gonna tell you a story anyway. A patient came with Lyme disease. I'm like, okay, take doxycycline. They come back to me three weeks later. They're like, Jerry, you're full of hot air. I don't feel any different. You don't feel different. Is it definitely Lyme disease? Is it flu? Is it rheumatoid? Is it COVID? You know, we always check for everything. And then I'm like, well, Harrison's principle says there are many different strains and behaviors of Lyme. So I stopped the doxycycline, put them on amoxicillin, and boom, within five days, they're back at work and feeling amazing. So again, remember there are multiple strains of Lyme that are out there. Now, as we looked at, ticks can carry other kinds of diseases, like this Powassan virus, um, relapsing fever called Borrelia miyamotai, Ehrlichia and Anaplasma and Colorado tick fever and Powassan. Luckily, the Stony Brook Southampton lab does a standard tick panel, and we check for almost all of these when we're working up Lyme. Just an interesting story about some of these diseases, it could take time to build up what we call an incubation period. The CDC on their website says the incubation period for Babesia is one to nine weeks. And I remember New Year's, the first week of January, diagnosing someone with Babesia. And the last they remember being outside was raking their lawn and cleaning up leaves uh, the end of November. I'm like, well, even the CDC says Babesia has a long incubation period. People, the message that we're trying to get across is this is a year round problem. This is not just something that happens Memorial Day to Labor Day. Look at the distribution of all the infections. Borrelia miyamotai, the tick-borne relapsing fever, much more common on the East Coast. And we are seeing that in Maine, um, and Massachusetts. Of course, we're all over the purple, the Babesia, um, Tularemia a little bit there as well. So the second message is one tick can give you several kinds of Lyme and different kinds of infections as well. Here's just a famous article on this Borrelia miyamotai, which is this relapsing fever. Somebody says they have a fever, then it goes away, the fever comes back, then it goes away, the fever comes back, then it goes away. This is happening in July, we're thinking Borrelia miyamotai, right? Luckily it's treated with doxycycline like Lyme disease. And you know they found this in Ixodes ticks, right? Which can carry Powassan virus, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, and Babesia. So one tick can, again, carry multiple kinds of infections. So how do these ticks actually get infected? Just to review that life cycle, right? You have the baby tick, 
and the baby tick has to feed on something like a bird, a mouse, a chipmunk. And then that little animal gives the infection to the tick. That tick passes the infection on to other animals like deer and chipmunks and things like that, which is why reducing deer exposure is critical. For example, I told you in the beginning my love affair with the four poster system uh, to really help to reduce the amount of tick infection out there. So now that nymphal and adult tick can pass the germ on to us, right? Our pets, our people. How many of you have had a dog on doxycycline, for example? Not uncommon out here, right? A couple of interesting facts about this. As we said, people with early disease who are recognized and treated do well. But if left untreated, the infection can get in the joints, the heart, and the nervous system from the CDC. And long-term infection is complicated because the germ is difficult and evades the immune system from that article we looked at. Patients with late disease often have multi-organ system like um, heartbeat and joints or joints and fatigue or headache and fatigue, things like that. And also Lyme disease has been reported in all 50 states. Is this because birds are moving the ticks around or because you're visiting in West Hampton, you get a tick bite, you fly home to Hawaii, and then your Lyme disease symptoms develop there. So if we're thinking you have Lyme disease, we're gonna do a blood test. The first blood test that we're gonna do um, is called the ELISA blood test, right? It's about 65% sensitive, right? So pretty much all your doctors and PAs out there know that the ELISA is not all telling. And very often we're going to do uh, what's called a two-tiered test where we do an ELISA also with a Western blot. A Western blot looks for antibodies made against the molecules from the Lyme germ. And it kind of looks like a supermarket barcode. And each little barcode tells us about the bacteria and kind of the area of the body that it might be infected, right? And it's looking at the series of the lines that tells us what to do about you. IgM is what we look for with a new active infection. And IgG is more of that older marker. So we kind of look at these through the timelines of the, your symptoms and when you've been sick. Here's just a great example of um, the Stony Brook Lyme test, right? Where we list all the different antigens, right? All the different bands, and it's in a numerical code. There's a couple of websites out there that tell you how to interpret the code. And then um, Imugen uh, also over there, an MDL from New Jersey, where they give you IgG and IgM. So the message is when you're getting a test for Lyme, you're probably getting an ELISA and you're getting a Western blot. And the Western blot includes a marker for active infection and old infection, right? Now here's an interesting thing from the CDC. I'm gonna read it to you because they say it so nicely. Some people who get antibiotics early in the disease may not develop antibodies. So if someone says, I had an erythema rash or I had a facial droop and I took three weeks of doxy, I'm like, well, maybe we shouldn't bother doing a Western blot because the CDC says you might not really be making antibodies. Or if you do get that test, maybe it'll end up being negative, right? And then we got other problems, right? And antibodies take weeks to develop. So if someone comes July 4th, they're like, oh, I've had the flu for three days, flu for three days, do a COVID swab, but we're not doing a Lyme test until you've had symptoms for a longer period of time. This is one of those classic co-infection panels where we're looking for Lyme, Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, at Southampton, we do what's called the TBD4M. It's basically got 
all the major four germs, and the M stands for the neomotai. Just an example of what like a Bartonella IgG and IgM and a Babesia IgG, IgM might look like. Luckily, this guy is negative, which is good news. Treatment, right? The standard new Lyme treatment is 21 to 30 days. Remember the patient that took doxycycline and didn't get better and I gave him amoxicillin? Ended up needing six weeks, you know what I mean? And sometimes you might actually feel worse before you feel better based on the behavior of the germ, what we call a Herxheimer reaction. Now people, in an added bonus, this is wonderful news. Doxycycline is great for ehrlichia. It's great for anaplasma. There's some data that shows that it also might work for Babesia. So when in doubt, we're giving people doxycycline. The bad news on Long Island is doxycycline can make people very sun sensitive. So a big hat, long sleeves, no beach, stuff like that. A really interesting treatment um, that they were working on at the Indiana University School of Medicine is they found that the Lyme disease germ depends on manganese and zinc as two of their major food sources. So what they published at Indiana University is like, maybe don't feed the Lyme germ and that's gonna help the people to get over it. And I'll tell you, I have patients come to my office and they're on zinc and they're on manganese and calcium and iron. I'm like, listen, people, you gotta stop taking all those vitamins. You're just feeding the germ that we're trying to kill. This is remarkable. Here's a great study from Johns Hopkins where they actually found that several essential oils like oregano, cinnamon bark, um, actually helped to treat Lyme better than some antibiotics. Rebecca and I were at a Lyme disease meeting together a long time ago. Rebecca, I don't know if you still have that picture somewhere, but if you were to tell me that, Jerry, Johns Hopkins is gonna publish on the use of essential oils to treat Lyme disease, I probably would have thought you were crazy and had you arrested. But this is really some of the amazing stuff that is happening out there. Okay, we have a few minutes to wrap it up. And as I told you, Lyme is 100% preventable, right? Um, so number one, get rid of mice, get rid of birds, right? Bird bath, wood piles, use the tick tubes, right? Reduce deer exposure, right? Protect yourself regularly, use duct tape, get a lint roller, right? Get rid of those darling little chipmunks. They're just moving ticks around, right? Now, ticks hate the scent of lavender. I use soap, detergent. Um, my kids put dryer sheets in their pockets to help keep ticks away. Now, if you're going into a high risk area, I do have people that will use DEET, right, on their skin. And then they'll use permethrin, right, available at every hardware store. You people have seen this yellow bottle everywhere, right, on your skin and on your clothing. I've literally had a pair of jeans sprayed with permethrin, and I saw a tick on it, and it literally shriveled up and it killed it. It was amazing, right? Again, using duct tape with the sticky side out to capture tick, ticks is amazing also. Also, um, Karen's favorite thing, she always likes me to remind everybody, when you've been outside, strip down, put all of your clothing in the dryer. The heat will kill the ticks. If you put them in the washer, the warm, soapy water actually feeds the ticks. They love the water right? Love humidity, right? Put your clothes in the dryer, use a lint roller on your body, and then wash your clothes, right? Very important. 
Again, this is the mice, but look at it very carefully. It's covered with these little baby ticks, right? Get rid of all of those mouse habitats. Please, you know, if you are going hiking, even at the Quag Wildlife Refuge, you know, stay in the center of the path. Avoid tall grasses, right? And we know that ticks will rarely, rarely cross a three foot wood chip border. Try to keep three feet around you and in your yard, keep a three foot wood chip border. It'll help to prevent ticks from moving around. Right, again, this lady here in blue is walking right through the tall grasses, making me nervous. You know what I mean? Wear light colored clothing like white or tan pants. And of course, use your permethrin on your clothing. Ticks do not fly, ticks do not jump. They hang out on the end of a leaf, waiting for you to brush against them. And that's how they grab you. We call this questing, right? Definitely treat your shoes. This permethrin will last for about a month. The first Sunday of every month at our house, we're spraying all of our clothing with permethrin and especially even flip-flops and sandals and shoes, things like that, right? The Environmental Working Group, um, which is um, very, you know, open and, you know, investigates natural and chemical types of repellents, you know, has found that oil of lemon eucalyptus is amazing. It's in almost every store. Great for your skin if you want to avoid DEET. Um, Picartan also, um, like uh, Repel, is probably the most famous Picartan that's out there. Also gives you a um, short, that gives you more of a short protection time, right? So even the Environmental Working Group says a brief chemical exposure is better than the risk of getting Lyme in your system. You go to ewg.org, they have got all this info for you. In a great scientific study, which looked at mosquitoes, but also applies to Lyme, right? Uh, they found that DEET and Cutter Lemon Eucalyptus. If you've got your cell phones, people, take a picture of this slide so you know what to get at the store, right? Um, Deep Woods Off, which I just showed you here. Uh, color of Lemon Eucalyptus, which my kids have outside right now. Eco Smart Organic. Uh, these had the most effective both upon application and after four hours. Remember, put something on your skin, like Lemon Eucalyptus, put something on your clothing, like the Permethrin, two layers of protection. Again, here's plenty of great studies on this, right? Tuck your pants into your socks, put some sticky um, tape around that as well. Check your dogs, check your cats, right? There's a Lyme vaccine for dogs, but it doesn't prevent them bringing the ticks into your house. And don't be that person that lets your outside dog sleep in your bed. That's where they're releasing all their ticks. If you do find a tick on you, you're going to look in your camping bag or on a belt or in your glove compartment, and you're going to grab this pack, your, your regional tick-borne disease tick removal kit, which is free, and you're going to take these super fine tip tweezers, grab the tick as close to your skin, and pull it perpendicular. Don't use a lighter. Don't use oil because you're going to make the tick angry and it could piss the uh, spit those germs right back into you, right? Save the tick. Testing the tick is controversial. I generally don't test the tick because I just want to look at the tick and know what's in there um, because that testing of the tick is very expensive. And we're going to know whether you need to do preventative early or not. If you do get a rash, take pictures, take pictures, take pictures. And I like to put wax paper over the rash and trace it, the shape of the rash and put the date and come back a day or two later to see if that rash is expanding or not. 
Now, erythema migrans is the target-like lesion of Lyme, but a tick bite reaction just from having that tick in you is what gives you that itchiness and usually clears up um, pretty quickly. Okay, people, it's time for the pop quiz answers. We're almost done. Ticks can only make you sick if they're attached more than 24 hours. False, right? Poisson virus and alpha-gal and some rickettsial diseases have a much faster transmission time. Lyme is the only serious tick illness. That's also false. Alpha-gal is serious. Rocky Mounted or Lichia also is serious, right? Alpha-gal meat allergy can be deadly, absolutely. Everyone with Lyme remembers a tick bite, false. The CDC says a positive Lyme test is required to diagnose Lyme, false. A tick can give you more than one illness, true, and more than one kind of Lyme. A summer flu could be tick illness, true. We'll provide you with a free tick removal kit, true. You can only get a tick bite in warm weather. False. And 90% or more of people with Lyme get over it. True. It's the 10% that Rebecca and I and the Stony Brook Southampton Tick Center are especially um, interested in. Please you know, thank Quag Wildlife um, for putting this whole thing on. They organized it. Um, here's my email. Here's Karen Wolfrut's email. And again, we've purchased all of these tickets for all 80 of you in the chat. Costs us between seven and ten dollars to make this. We're always accepting donations to make the next pack for the next lecture. Um, there's our donation link there. Uh, here's Karen's uh, email, my email. Um, as well. And um, this is all going to be recorded and put up on YouTube because I know I kind of talk fast and you might have missed a few things, right? Um, so let's see. Laura asked a question, an allergy to tick saliva, right? Yep. The tick saliva has a protein in it, write this down, called SALP15 or SALP15. Um, which many people can have a significant um, reaction to that SALP15 protein, right? Maggie, you're spraying every week for ticks. Great. I mean, we spray at my house. We spray about every month or so, right? Alpha-gal, Linda. Yes. Um, I have found that people with alpha-gal, when you check their blood, have a low IgM, immunoglobulin, I'm sorry, IgA, immunoglobulin A like apple, which is produced by the gut mucosa. When we treat a low IgA, which is a different lecture altogether, um, I've seen people alpha-gal numbers go down. So yes, Linda, you're absolutely, you're going to be able to go to that barbecue again. Although I'm not a barbecue guy because that's a pro-carcinogen thing. Uh, that's another lecture altogether, right? Uh, Lynn Joyce, how do you feel about spraying? What we do at my house is spring and fall. Uh, we use East End Tick Control. Uh, Brian Kelly, we use a permethrin spray to get rid of the babies. Um, and then we'll alternate that with organic spray. Uh, but when you see those East End Tick trucks all over town, they're the people that are battling the Lyme um, and getting rid of those tick densities, right? Yeah, Michelle, remove two ticks from her, right? Well, I would really have to look at it. We can't officially give medical advice, but I tell people, you know, take pictures, look for a rash. Um, I like topical Lugol's iodine to reduce um, itching and irritation. Um, Sunday, and now is Wednesday, if there's any changes at the site, you need that either your doc or your PA to look at that. Monica, tick tubes, any ACE hardware store, um, Shinnecock, East Hampton, Bridgehampton, um, they're little, they look like toilet paper tubes. 
with cotton balls soaked in permethrin. You throw them around your yard. And if there's any mice, they grab those cotton balls, which are soaked with permethrin into their nest. And that helps to kill the tick. They really reduce tick population in your yard. Great, Chuck, right? He had two ticks and he was given two doxycycline and shown that it would prevent Lyme, right? Um, so again, this is my opening slide where it's a little controversial. Yale New Haven did a big study on taking two doxycycline with Lyme disease. And they found that um, after two doxycycline, you did not get the erythema migrans rash. That was the only particular thing um, that, that was studied. I have some people that will use that Johns Hopkins essential oil for a month. Some risky tick bites, I personally may give more than just um, two pills. But again, this is where you're, you know your body, you're really monitoring yourself, right? Janet, when is the optimal time to get tested? Typically, if you think of those immunoglobulin in the Western blot, it's going to take at least 30 days for you to seroconvert if you have not had any antibiotics, right? Um, Barbara, a nurse removed a tick with liquid nitrogen. Um, that's typically not a protocol that I use um, because as Rebecca from our tick hotline will tell you, anything that irritates the tick could piss that tick off and the infection in the saliva gland could push right back into you. So we don't use lighters, we don't use oil, we use our tick kit, right? We've got 80 of these ready for you. And we take our fine forceps and we pull it out perpendicular. If you can't get all of the tick out, I'll use a punch biopsy to uh, remove the residual part of the tick that's in there. So we only remove ticks following the CDC protocol with Karen's special forceps. Mora, a dream come true. Mora Tiley, I was hoping somebody would ask this question. Is there any possibility for a vaccine? There is, but the problem is the vaccine would have to cover all of the strains of Lyme and you would still have to be as nervous about tick bites as you are because that vaccine does not cover Babesia, Bartonella, Tularemia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Ehrlichia, things like that. In the 90s, when there was a, in the 90s, when there was a Lyme disease vaccine, landscapers were going out and getting tick bites. They did not get Lyme, but they did get Babesia and other tick germs. So Maura, I don't see a vaccine logically fitting in because you're gonna have to be as scared of ticks and as protective against ticks, right? Yeah, Laura, what meat is involved? Basically it's hoofed meat, like uh, anything from a cow, pork, lamb, things like that. Fish um, is all okay, things like that, right? And look out, even like marshmallows have gelatin. Holly St. Pierre, a bird haven, right? Anybody's yard with a bird bath or a bird feeder attracts birds. Those birds drop ticks. Any of the bird food that falls onto the ground attracts mice and chipmunks, which bring even more ticks into your yard. So I said, it is bad news to have to get rid of all of the birding equipment in your backyard, but it's for your ultimate protection. Uh, yeah, Bob, rabbits also. Rabbits can carry tularemia. They carry a lot of ticks on their long, fluffy ears and probably their tail. Uh, Carol, the tick kit. Um, you could email Karen uh, for information. Um, I believe that they will get shipped to you, but maybe we'll have Karen on mute in a minute and tell us more about the tick kit. Up, oh, I think you're still muted, Karen. Up, oh, lower left, there's a button. Let me answer some more of the questions. Oh, 
it might be that you're on force mute. So yes, I'm going to change that right now. Sorry. Sorry, Karen. Got it. Okay. Look at this, Stacy. Are there Lyme disease specialists in Southampton? That's what our tick hotline, our phone number is for. Uh, Rebecca can help to hook you up with someone um, that can help you with your particular situation. Karen, are you on? I am. What I was just going to say is if you email me uh, requesting a tick removal kit, just provide your mailing address. Provide your mailing address. And the donation website is up on the screen, but we've already paid for these, right? Yes, yes. Great. And I think Rebecca's still out there somewhere. I don't know if she wants to unmute and add anything on. There she is, my partner in crime. Most of the people that when they call, I, I do take down their address and we do send them. We actually send them to their personal address plus um, one of our new uh, books. So Wonder, yeah, uh, the new book everybody's getting booklet. The, yeah, the book. Yeah. Yes. yes the um, books go out with the kids. Books and the kit together. So, incredible winner. Yeah. So everybody, a lot of people are getting tick kits and the and the booklets. Yep. We're in pick tick tick season. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maura asks, is the rash always at the site of the bite? Not necessarily. It's something called a satellite lesion, where you get bitten on your elbow and you get the rash on your chest. Pest, uh, chest. Katie, would a tick key work? Um, we actually tested those, um, or what we call a tick spoon. And some people, you know, what we call the fulcrum action uh, with those tick kits, the tick key, they got the body off and then they left the head in, right? So that's why when um, the Southampton Hospital Tick Center decided on what to put on our kit, we voted for the forcep, not a key. So um, Chuck, yeah, thank you. This is all going to go up on the Quag YouTube website in case you uh, um, missed anything. Deer fences. Um, deer fences are good for deer, but not for mice, right? That's a whole nother story altogether. Great. Um, and then uh, 726 TICK is our hotline. Right? Yep. Great. Now, everybody, uh, next week, in conjunction with Eastern Long Island Hospital, the three of us will be back doing a very similar talk, a little different. So if you want to hear this again, um, you can absolutely um, tune in next week, I believe, at 4 o'clock for another really exciting um, tick overview. So I'll be around to answer a few other questions. We're a little bit over our promised time of uh, 18, a lot over our promised time of 1815. Um, and we will see you guys next time. All right, have a good night, everybody. Thank you Bye. so much, Jerry. You bet, we'll see you then. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a great night.